Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. But first, a word from our sponsor. The Choctaw Nation has always provided a foundation upon which a future can be built. From our home in Southeast Oklahoma to a bingo hall that grew to be one of the largest casinos in the world. Today's summer school programs lay the groundwork for a love of learning. Small business programs support local economies. And with over 10,000 jobs created, Choctaw offers financial stability to tribal members and our neighbors. Together we build success because together we're more. Hello, Native Chalk Talk listeners out there. This is part two of Monroe Satoke, descendant of Hunting Horse, a co-talker, and the Kiowa Five. If you haven't listened to the first episode, just go ahead and back it on up, folks, and go find part one. Monroe and I thank you, and we hope you'll enjoy. Now, to my listeners, y'all, I am absolutely excited to also share with you that not only is Monroe an incredible artist, he is also the relative of Monroe Satoke, one of the Kiowa Five. Now in Oklahoma, and for those in the U.S. who know Native art, the Kiowa Five are famous and are extremely important to our indigenous art. If you're not familiar, please go look them up. Monroe, I grew up knowing about the Kiowa Five, and it wasn't until I moved away from Oklahoma that I realized not everyone knew about their work. So why don't you tell us all a bit about them? Well, Monroe Satote was born in 1904, and my great-grandfather, his name was Hunting Horse, and he had two wives, which were sisters. One was named Pitoma, and the other one was named Pitma. And we come from a Pitoma family. We live around what we call Saddle Mountain, south of Carnegie, Oklahoma. That's our home place. That way back in the day, they gave 160 acres to each Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache member when the land run happened. That 160 acres, a hunting horse built his home on that allotment. Monroe had three brothers. One passed away when he was younger and then two more that became ministers. And Monroe, his paintings, they're more spiritual. He was a member of the Native American church. When Hunting Horse, he would have his meetings. His brother Cecil uh, would uh, carry drum, and Monroe would take care of the fire. He was uh, one of the leaders in the Native American church. And so from the time that he was able to, he helped in the Native American church, and he had participated many times in the, the service in, in the teepee, in the, what we call the peyote sanctity meetings. He would get visions, and a lot of his paintings are of these visions that he, he received from those meetings that he participated in. He only painted for a short time, and uh, he passed away when he was, what, 33? So, yeah, very young. Yeah. In that short time, he was able to produce masterpieces along with the other Kiowa artists. It amazes me every time I see his artwork, the knowledge that he had, and was able to transfer that from his mind to his hand and put it on a Mm -hmm. piece of paper or canvas and show that artistic talent, natural ability that he had to share with the whole world. So he grew up in a a real modest way, a hunting horses family. There's probably, we could probably start our own tribe if we wanted to. There's (laughs) five, six hundred of us nowadays. But yeah, he he grew, my dad grew up, he was younger, but he grew up with Monroe. And Monroe was going on a trip to California because these people, family wanted him to bring his artwork and they were going to help him with his travel and everything. And he wanted my dad to go with him. Of course, my dad was like 11 or 12. And my grandmother, she didn't want him to leave because he was so young. I wonder what would have happened if he went. And I know, right? Was with Monroe all that time. Man, a missed opportunity. I understand why, because he was young. But 
if we were to back up to the history, it's so fascinating. So um, if you don't mind my taking a minute to do that, in Anadarko, Oklahoma, a woman named Susan Peters saw that Monroe and five other students loved to draw, and they really had some talent. So she supplied them with paper and supplies to let them express themselves. In the 1920s, Susan convinced the University of Oklahoma to create a program at OU, and they were coached by a woman named Edith Mahier. Oscar Johnson was the professor at OU that took these five Kiowa Five in and gave them a place to learn. They didn't get degrees, but were some of the first to get a formal college education, and they stayed on campus. So I, you know, I mentioned Susan Peters and how she was very instrumental in this situation, but I'm about to tell you a terrible part of the story for which I am now outing myself and I feel so guilty about, but I figured since you came clean about the window breaking bandit mm-hmm. that you are at Riverside. So St. Patrick's Mission School opened in 1911 in Anadarko and served the Comanche, Apache, and the Kiowa. And some of the Kiowa artists took art classes under a Choctaw nun named Sister Olivia Taylor. By the way, for our listeners, Monroe's grandpa did not go to school there, but later he joined the others when they went to OU for the lessons. Anyway, how do I personally fit into this equation? Well, back in the 1980s, there were still the old buildings from St. Patrick's. We're talking historical buildings that didn't have windows any longer, but the old beds were still in there and the old wooden plank floors, and they were just cool old buildings. A friend of ours wanted to tear it down. I don't know if it was for the materials or if St. Patrick's, you know, wanted the buildings gone. And so they asked him to tear it down. He was a friend. So my family and I went to help him tear the buildings down. Those buildings should have been placed in a National Registry of Historical Places now that I look back. But here's little old Rachel back in the 80s tearing down these very historic buildings where it could be some of the Kiowa Five possibly walked around. So you're welcome, world. Don't tell anyone where I live, Monroe. I may have lovers mm-hmm. of history come after me, and I would deserve it. So are you still willing to be my friend? Yes, well, that won't matter. Because if not, I was going to bring <laughs> up three words, window-breaking bandit. But <laughs> anyway, so six of these students really stood out and became known as the Kiowa Five. Spencer Asa, Jack Hokea, James Ukiah, Lois Smokey Kaladi, Stephen Mopope, and of course, Monroe Zatok, whom you're named after. They even received the international recognition with an exposition in Prague and then other countries to follow, and their prints were published in Kiowa art in France. When I was growing up, we sometimes called them the Kiowa Five or the Kiowa Six, and that's because there was only one woman in the group, and her name was Lois Smokey Kaladi, and she got married and she exited the group before their popularity went international. And since she left so soon and didn't have as many paintings, those are the most rare of them all although all pieces from all six of the artists are very valuable. But even more than the dollar value, the Kiowa Five paintings have been described as the most important Native American art of all time, due to the fact that there was, you know, there was nothing created from the Native world like that before. They were given some general guidance in the very beginning, but they just painted what they felt, untarnished, no instruction on European art or outside influences. So imagine that your own frowned upon race and culture and art starts to come into the spotlight in a good way, even to where the same public who once hated your race now wants to buy your work. I wonder how they felt at that time, you know, being applauded for their talents. So this was in the early 1920s when all this took place and Monroe would have been in his late teens. Is that correct? Yes. They began to get offers, show their artwork. When they produced their artwork, uh, they began to go out and get publicity and show type of work. Their work is not contemporary and it's more of a two-dimensional, which it doesn't show a lot of shading, not too much. I mean, they're like the uh, subject matter is has no base, like grass or ground, or I, I would say it's real simple simplicity. But it, you know, they use a lot of detail with their paintbrushes to put in areas, and yeah, they would they would go different places. And one place that I remember is that. I see pictures of them dressed up in their regalia. Stephen Malpope, James Ochai, Jack Hokey, and Monroe would sing uh, the songs for them. He was a singer, and uh, I don't know if he composed any of the songs. Spencer Asad, and the, they would dance, and Monroe would sing. They would go out to Gallup, New Mexico, and they had a gathering of tribes from all over the United States to come and participate. And so the Kiowas 
I, I believe Dr. Jacobson began to take them out there to not only perform and do their ceremonial traditional dances, but also to sell their artwork. So it was a two for one. You know, they participated in that fashion, not just a money maker, but also to participate with the other tribes. They get offers to go to different places and, and so forth. And then I think that there was a an opportunity you talked about where they all came together. There were 30 tribes and they did these, they climbed on top of these 50 foot poles or something, right? Yes, that was a tribe from Mexico, Mexican Indians. And I'm not exactly sure of the name of that tribe, but... And, of course, all, most of these tribes, they do their ceremonial, traditional dances. Well, there would be four of them, and one of them had a flute, and they had a pole, and they would do a little, I guess we call it sacrifice. They would get a chicken, and they would cut the chicken, and the blood of the chicken, they would sprinkle it around the pole. And then after that, they had a tequila they open a bottle of tequila and pour that tequila around the pole to bless it, pray over it, so that whatever they do, you know, their performance, would, everything would go well. The one with, with the flute, he would climb all the way to the top of that pole, and it was probably at least 40 feet high, and the area that he would stand on the pole, which was probably uh, maybe a foot in diameter, and then after he got up there, the other four would climb all the way up. And they had a rope tied to their one of their legs, ankles. Wow. When they got on top, the flute player would start singing and playing the flute. And while he's doing that, all of a sudden these guys would fall backward. And they would come down, spiral down from that pole all the way down to the ground. Wow. Yeah, and that was really interesting. And then they had a... Aztecas, I think they were from California, that they did their dances. And of course, there's a lot of the Pueblo tribes that were out there that did their ceremonials. Of course, the Kiowas, they did their uh, war dances and showed what they did. Mm-hmm. And that Gallup ceremonials have been going on a long time. My uncle, my brothers, and I have participated even today. Now, I don't know for sure if it's going to it's in August. Uh-huh. I don't know if it's going to happen because of this pandemic. You know, oh. it, it shut down a lot of things. Some of the reservations have been closed up to this point. So I don't know if they're going to have that ceremony. But that's where Monroe and the other Kyle artists would participate. And it's still going on today. So that, you know, for me, being able to go out there and dance on that same ground where they participate is, yeah. is something special. Very know. special. And that's something to see, man. They were, I mean, they had gained quite a bit of prestige. Didn't they go to England as well? Yes, uh, they went up to England. They displayed their artwork there. And, of course, I'm, I'm sure that they put on their program performances. And from what I understand is that Monroe, I don't know about the other ones, but Monroe was dubbed a knight wow. at that time in England. And I don't know who the king or queen was at that time. Mm-hmm. It must have been in the late 20s, I guess, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. But How cool is that? Yes. Dubbed Sir, a knight. Sir Monroe. If I were dubbed a knight, I would be constantly going, please bow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh-huh. you. And I'd yeah. swing my sword around I'd a few have times. somebody in front of me and say, everybody bow <laughs> down. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Sir Knight Monroe is coming through. <laughs> Royalty in the house. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Put down what you're doing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, you know, when I heard that, that's that was awesome. Right. To see, see some Native Indian boy become yeah. a knight. That's something special. Very much so. You talked a little bit about what Monroe's paintings looked like. And, and at one point, I know you talked about the Aninga, the water bird, I believe. Water bird, you know, they use that in the Native American church, you know, and it's used that several different times. Way early in the morning, they bring it in water to give to all of the members that are in the church, and they, they see her, and they use the water bird, you know, at that time. But there's two different types of water birds. Mm-hmm. One's called a comorant. It has a shorter neck than the, the other one. is called an anhinga, 
the anhinga has a long neck and the long neck water bird is what they use the tail feathers oh. and if you look at the tail feathers they're all black except for the tips they're kind of an orangish yellow and they have ripples like water on the tail and that orange and yellow is like the sun coming up beautiful from the east in the morning and uh, monroe hmm. has done several paintings over the comorant and i i know that he took a lot of thought and uh, prayer you know coming up with these different ideas beautiful folks you can look it up um, google monroe sato paintings uh, one thing you mentioned one time to me about that you love that his paintings relay the simplicity in life, no cell phone, no internet. It just takes you to the Indian life, just enjoying the land and the simple things. And that really spoke to me. Where can we see Kiowa Five Pieces today? Well, one place that's, I guess it's pretty accessible is at the state capitol, Oklahoma State Capitol, on the southeast side, there's a building. And it used to be the Oklahoma Historical Building. But since then, they built a new historical building. But in that old historical building, and then I'm not really sure what it's used for right now, but there's paintings, I believe, on the second floor of the some of the Kiowa Five work. And I know that Monroe has several nice. pictures, paintings there. And they're, they're like maybe three or four feet wide and about six feet tall. Okay. So they're fairly big. Wow. They're on the walls, uh, you know, as you walk down the hallway. Of course, they have several different ones at University of Oklahoma, their museum there, at Gilcrease in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Herd Museum in Phoenix, uh, Arizona, and, uh, you know, of course, private collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they still have those in uh, the museums. They put them in special places to show because, you know, that's a big part of oh, yeah. our history here in Oklahoma. Absolutely. So I also noticed you can see some pieces at the National Cowboy and Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. And what I also love is that in my hometown in Anadarko, the post office has murals of Kiowa traditions painted by Stephen Mopope, one of the Kiowa Five who painted them in 1937. I remember going into the post office growing up and I just love them. The colors are vibrant earth tones and the people and depictions like look sort of like flat and to the point, no frills. And now you can also buy stamps online that have the murals. I actually bought mine from the Anadarko post office when they launched in 2019 and I framed them, but it looks like you can still buy them online. Just search for Kiowa Moving Camp Stamps. And check out our Native Chalk Talk Facebook page to see the stamps and photos of the murals, as well as pictures of Monroe and his beautiful wife, Johanna. And by the way, Susan Peters, the gal that originally encouraged OU to accept the artist she believed in, there's a Susan Peters Gallery in Anadarko. I know if you Google it, it says that it's permanently closed. It is not. I was over there just this week looking at the beautiful things inside. Paintings from various artists there like White Buffalo, Robert Leonard, Redbird. Robert Redbird, Leonard Riddles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John White. So it is just this treasure trove in this really small town in Oklahoma. And it has these original paintings in the Susan Peters Gallery that you can actually buy. And when I was there this week uh, on some of the paintings, they were 40% off. And so, you know, while it's there, be sure to go and check it out. It's right next door to McKee's Indian Store, which is also a great place to buy um, Native American jewelry. I have many pieces from there and they're very affordable and just beautiful. Some of them are made by local artists. So I have to give Susan Peters big kudos for respecting and seeing the talent that arose from these groundbreaking artists. And Indian art is what it is today, much in part due to this, these Kiowa Five. I know that you mentioned when you went to, um, you know, when you were six or seven, your dad took you to the Susan Peters house in Oklahoma, right? I'm not exactly sure, but I remember going with my dad. A lot of times my dad would take me with him, maybe because I was the smartest in of course you were, right? <laughs> and I was his favorite, so we <laughs> went to Anadarko, and I still remember pulling up to the little, it was like a bungalow house, just a small, mm -hmm. and I don't even know how many bedrooms, but went in, and had a gate, and we walked in the gate, and she come to the door, and she opened the door, and when we went in, it just looked like a regular house, but when we went in, it was like a museum. I mean. Wow. Uh, there were pictures and arts and crafts all over her, her uh, living room and in her dining room attached together. There was a buffalo robe that was laying on one of the tables. And 
man, I was just in awe when I seen all that. It was, it was, yeah, it was surrounded a, by beauty. And was it all Native American art? Yes, all of all the artwork and the crafts she had. Uh, I said, man, if I could, I'd take some of this stuff yeah. home because they, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was all, all eye catching. The oh, paintings, I bet. Uh, jewelry, the arts and crafts, everything. I'll never forget that first meeting. My dad wow. introduced me to her, and I mean, just to know that being in her house, in her presence, the one that helped my grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, become who he was. And you, even as an artist yourself, I mean, the, you brought a work over today that's absolutely beautiful. I wish my listeners could see it. I will post a photo of it on the uh, Native Talk Talk Facebook page, but it's this beautiful golden yellow with, and is that a sun or a moon behind the, the Indian? Yes. Both. Okay. And he's standing there in his headdress. It's just a beautiful piece. It's very vibrant. And so anyway, back to... You know, when it, when it comes to Susan Peters, she paved the way for your grandpa. And then now you are an artist as well on your own right. But it, but it really helped pave the way, right? Yeah, there's many influences, you know, throughout growing up, people recognizing the name. And, and uh, Monroe Satoks mentioned in the Oklahoma History book. And I had, I don't know how many times people come up and say, are you Monroe Satoks? And I say, yep. And I say, man, we've seen your name in a, in a history book. And uh, yeah, his name was in there. And, you know, there's along the way of growing up, there there was always something surrounding art. Being around that and uh, having the influence in, in college, I think I changed my degree, what I wanted to do in five times. You know, yeah. <laughs> going all the way back to art and becoming a teacher. You know, I, I mentioned my brother, his son is at uh, American Indian Arts Institute in Santa Fe. And graduated this past fall, and he's living out there and making a living off of his artwork. So wow. It, it does run in the family. Yes, it does. I wish so, I had a little touch of that. And so I'm curious, Monroe, do you own any of your grandpa's original paintings? No, and i tell you what, I've seen a lot of his work. Amazed at how much he's produced in a short amount of time. But as far as I know, none of my family members own any. And I've seen him in museums. The only place I've seen a piece of his work, and it was just a four-inch by five-inch uh, work of art in Gallup, uh, New Mexico, in one of the stores. And they wanted like five, $600 for it. And if I had the money, I would have bought it, but I didn't have it at the time. And that's a lot um, for that small of a yeah, painting. That's that amazing. Picture. And it was original. Wow. You know, other than that, I, I never, I did look on Google and, Places. I did too. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I don't know for sure. Yeah. They say as is, you know, it could be a print, you know. Right. So, well, yeah. they're still hard to find, though. I mean, yeah. especially the, the Monroe Sotoke ones. Some of the other Kiowa Five have seen a little bit easier to find, but. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they say there's a portfolio. I, I believe it was this lady from California that got a lot of their pictures and she made a portfolio out of them. And that's one of those things that I'd like to get my hands yeah, on. Yeah, right? You had mentioned one time that there's this place in Norman, I won't say the name of the establishment, that has photographs of Monroe and the Kiowa Five, and you had asked if you could have a copy, and they wouldn't mm -hmm. let you have a make a copy, right? Well, yeah, and I was over there invited to come, and uh, I took my grandson up there. They were having an art show, and uh, I seen some of Monroe's portraits, and I asked if I could have one, and they looked at each other, their board, all the members were there, and they kind of whispered among themselves, but they never gave me an answer. So, you know, maybe I'll go back and try again. But yeah, uh, there's several pictures that we have, but those at that place, I, I'd like to have a copy of those just for myself. Yeah, and you deserve to have at least a copy of a photo, if not at least one painting, you know? I mean, you're related to and named after the guy, and you walked in his footsteps and became an amazing artist yourself and an art teacher. So listen, to my listeners out there, does anyone have any Kiowa 5 and Road Satoka originals out there? Have a heart and please consider donating one to Monroe or his family. I'm serious, y'all. If you're willing to do so, you can find my contact info at nativechalktalk.com. You'll have many jewels in your crown if you do this good deed. And so, what became of your grandpa? I, I would like to add this. If, if that happens and somebody offers one of Monroe's originals, 
I would be glad to paint you a picture and trade you one of my pictures for his. I love that. Monroe, he passed away, I believe, at the age of 33, that uh, epidemic back way back in the day. Even when he was sick in the hospital, he still did art, you know, wow. until a few days he passed away. I mean, that's how much he would love to do art. Even at that young age, like I said, he, he produced a lot of artwork. Yes, he did. And he had a, a strong belief in our our tradition and our tribes of the Kiowa. I, I'm just glad that I, I'm a part of that yes, know, sir. in my own life. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's something to be very, very proud of. Yeah, died in 1937, as you said, at age 33 of tuberculosis. And we'll never be able to really truly physically measure all the impact that he made on Native art and Indians that came after him that paved the way for them. And so we are indeed grateful. Today, we honor your Grandpa Monroe and the Kiowa Five. Thanks for sharing these personal insights. And now let's talk about uh, your ancestors. So you talked a little bit about Hunting Horse, and his dad's name was Turtle. And now let's talk about your ancestors. Hunting Horse is my great-grandfather. You know, the Kiowa history, it goes back. As far as I know, there's other stories, but origination is from around that Yellowstone area. And some people say that they came from Canada down. They were in the Yellowstone area of Wyoming for a while, and then they moved to the Black Hills. And they were there for a while, made friends with the Crow and uh, uh, several of the other tribes. But they were forced out of that Black Hills area by the Lakotas, Dakotas, and because they were bigger tribes. And so moving down this way through Kansas and Hunting Horse, he was a little boy when they were traveling. And his father's name was Turtle. And the story just mentions Hunting Horse and his dad and mom. They were coming, and I'm sure that they were with a group of Kiowas. And when they got into around Oklahoma, Kansas, they were, I guess, attacked by the Pawnees. And when they were in a skirmish a battle, Hunting Horse's dad, Turtle, got killed. So Hunting Horse and his mother were taken captive to the Pawnee, and he stayed there a, a long time. I won't go into details because it's a story in itself, but the Pawnees are related, or they have family with the Wichitas. And so when the Pawnees came to visit the Wichitas, they seen Hunting Horse. By that time, his, his mother had died because of physical abuse. Because they were taken as slaves, right? Yeah, yeah, they were mistreated. And anyway, the Wichita's traded for hunting horse, a mule and rifles or something like that. And so hunting horse grew up in the Wichita tribe from a little boy up into a young age. And I believe that he even married into the Wichita tribe at first. And then they were having a big ceremony in the southwest Oklahoma with all of the Kiowas, Comanches, and and other tribes. I'm not sure exactly what the gathering was. Might have been a sun dance, but they were all there. And the Wichita's went there with the and the Pawnees. There were some there too. So when they went there, the Kiowas recognized Hunting Horse, and so they went to talk to the Wichita's, and they bartered to give him back to the Kiowas. And so that's how he made his way back to the Kiowas. Uh, his mother and, and father got killed. Uh, but he he made it all the way back to his own people. Wow, and, <laughs> what a journey. Being a, being a young man, mm -hmm. finally coming back to the Kiowa people. They're like, hey, yeah, where'd and, you go? There was a big celebration <laughs> because he made it back home. Yeah. Which is was not usually the case. There was not usually a lot of coming back home. No. You know, and then growing up and then his wives, the two, they were captives. You know, our way, if you can take care of your family, you know, you can provide for them, feed them, then you were able to have more than one wife. It wasn't against the law back then, but nowadays it is. Uh, but he was able to take care of the two wives, and so that's a part of our history there. Yeah. And then he went on his first raid when he was 12 years old, right? Yes. Uh, they were getting a war party to go down into Texas. He wanted to go with them. So, you know, at that time, I guess 
well, nowadays, you know, you think of that's too young, you can't yeah. go. But back then, you know, it's a part of life, survival. So mm -hmm. they let him go, and they, they said he needed to paint up. So his colors that he used was white, and he painted, uh, you know, his face and his arms, and he put, like, maroon stripes on his face and his arms and, and on his horse. And when they went down, they came up on some uh, settlers. And uh, so being 12, the older uh, warriors, they didn't want him to go. So what they told him to do was to stay back, being so young, and hold on to the horses. And when they get ready to leave, that all they could do is run up, grab their horse, and take off if they were being followed or being attacked. So that was his job. And actually, that's where he got his name, Hunting Horse, because ah. he was watching the ponies for the warriors. Right. Cool name, too. And, you know, obviously that's the name of the church that preach in now, Hunting Horse, right? Yes. When the first Christians that came around, our people were the Baptists. And the Baptists, they began to build churches and so forth. And then the Methodists, and there was a few Catholic churches that began to come in. So Hunting Horse, having his family, two families, and wanting to join a church, he went to the Baptist church. And this has, you know, nothing to do denominations or anything, but it's a part of our story. Mm -hmm. So he went to the Baptist, and the preacher met him at the front door. And, of course, he had his two wives and his kids. And, and when he'd come up to the door, the preacher, Baptist preacher, said, what, what do you need? He said, I want to come and join your church. And so the Baptist church leader looked at his family and said, well, I'll tell you what, if you get rid, rid of one of your wives and their family and you keep one, you can come in and join the church. Oh, Lord. So Hunting Horse turned around and just took his family back home. So a few weeks, uh, he went to the Methodist church. And when he went to the Methodist church, the preacher came out and met him at the door, and he greeted him, and he said, what do you need? He said, I want to come and join your church. And the Methodist preacher said, come on in. So that's how we became Methodists. Wow. They were welcome. Yeah. Eventually, he did live with one of the wives, and he built a home for the other wife. Yeah. She lived close by, but, you know, that being a Christian and wanting to do the right thing, mm -hmm. and, you know, learning Wow. And I believe that changing as you go, learning what's right and wrong, you know, according to the Bible, person that changes, well, you know, that's good. So he wanted to do the right thing, and that's what happened. So, and here we are, we, most of my family belongs to the Methodist Church. All, all since then. That's yeah. such an interesting story. You wonder what the criteria was for picking which wife, you know, who made better, better fry bread or... The story about Quanta Parker had five wives. Mm -hmm. And when he went to the nation's capital, I forgot who the president was, uh, met him at the steps going up into the capital. And the president at that time said, Quanta Parker, you know it's against the law to have more than one wife. And Quanta Parker looked at him and then looked at his wife. He said, well, I'll tell you what, sir, you pick the one that I keep and tell the rest to leave or go home. And he didn't want to get beat up. Quanta Parker knew what was. He knew better. The president looked at him and he said, well, that's okay. Come on. <laughs> he didn't want to get beat up either. So. Right. They're like, well, Lord, just lay low for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Hunting Horse talks about, and I, I guess he wrote a manuscript at one point. I don't know if it was in that or just stories told and passed along, but when he was a little boy, he remembered it being cold outside. and That manuscript, and I don't know if it would, became a book, and I, I tried to look for it, but, you know, I guess I'll find it one of these days. Yeah. But it, it was called, And Now I Am Born, and it told his life story. And at one point, it was late fall, becoming winter. And then, of course, growing up, he lived in a teepee. Uh, he said he remembers being little, and uh, it was snowing outside, and all, all he had on was some moccasins and a bridge cloth. And that was the only clothes he had on. And he, he said he'd run in and out of the teepee and just playing all over, <laughs> not worried about how cold it was. Tough kids, man. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, we're so spoiled, we wouldn't even 
be able to survive that. I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it didn't bother him. He just uh, had fun playing around free and just to do what he wanted wow. to. Yeah. Tough kid. And then at one point, the U.S. government had captured the Kiowa, Apache, and Comanche, and they brought them to Fort Sill. He kind of made the best of it, didn't he, by serving the military, right? Yeah, and w- there's several factors that come into the reservation thing. They killed most of the buffalo, which was their main source of food, and then they took away their religion and told them not to participate in those religions that we had. So Hunting Horse, I believe that he seen the changes that were happening. I would think that he seen all of the changes. They couldn't stay free to roam and do what they wanted to. So uh, what he did was he joined the military and he became a scout for the 7th Cavalry or the Cavalry. Mm-hmm. The 7th Cavalry came up through later, but became a scout along with Big Bo and ICO. ICO was a sergeant, but he served in the military as a scout. Today, on Fort Sill Post in Lawton, Oklahoma, there's a a little cemetery place called Chief's Knoll, K-N-O-L-L, and that's where uh, he's buried along with Big Bo and some of the other military. I've been to that cemetery. Yeah, and I, I don't know this, I don't know, again, coincidence, but Big Bo and Hunting Horse are side by side and we went to visit and Johanna's uh, ancestors, Big Bo, of course, mine is Hunting Horse. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah, I mean. It's meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> the families yeah, were meant to come I mean, together. Uh, you know, it's kind of wow. hard to wreck. Wow, oh, that's really cool. That, but yeah, and my grandpa, he was born in a tent teepee right there on the Medicine Creek right there. They they had barracks, but Hunting Horse didn't want to live in a barracks, so he took his family, and they live on a teepee right next to Medicine Bluff. He served, and uh, every year that I can remember, the military honored Hunting Horse's birthday, and uh, they would have a big feast. They would kill a buffalo, and the military would bring out a lot of the soldiers. They would put up a big big green army tent. I mean, that thing was like 40 foot by 50 foot long. Then they'd set up tables and then they'd cook that buffalo and then they'd have a big old feast and generals, I remember generals coming out there and then my dad and the family, they would do some traditional songs and then they have a flag raising and it was just a whole wow. day of celebration. And I remember this one time that there was a general that came in a helicopter and the helicopter landed in a pasture and the general came and greeted my great grandpa. And they did that for the longest time. My great grandpa, he lived to be 107. He was a small in stature, maybe 5'7", five, 5'8", five, rode horses until he was 92. Uh, he just lived a long, long life and uh, he passed away a year after I was born, I talked to one of my family members and I said, I wonder if he held me in his arms, you know, and, and prayed or whatever over me. And she said, well, when he was still alive, everybody would go to his house and he would go to every child, grandchild, great grandchild and just at least touch them or just so you definitely were touched by him at some point i must have been held in his arms when i was a baby that's so so cool to think about right yeah i didn't get to meet him personally but yeah you know just that thought of knowing that Mm -hmm. he held me as something special so special yeah so i love that and you told me this really cool story about he would go to visit this mexican man who was married into the comanche tribe right right this uh Mexican man, he was married to Comanche, and he spoke a hunting horse. He would go to their house, and they would visit, and they couldn't speak the same language, but they used sign language, which is a lost way of communicating. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would make sign languages to each other, and every once in a while you could hear them just laugh (laughs) as hard as they could to each other. I mean, they spend almost all day just talking with the sign language. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I, so I, re- cool. I remember seeing that. I said, man, that's that's something else. They don't speak the same language, but they do <laughs> uh-huh. with the sign language. Yeah, yeah, it was that universal language where they yes. could all speak to each other. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, he, he went out and uh, 
tried to convince some of the members of the tribes to come in and, you know, live a peaceful life. But I believe it was General Custer came through Fort Sill and he was headed up north. And when they were getting ready to leave, he wanted some extra scouts to go with him. And so, and I'm not sure about the other scouts, but when, when Hunting Horse was asked to go up there, up north, thought about it, but he didn't want to leave his family. So he he declined to go and be a scout for Custer, 7th Cavalry. And so when he decided not to go, they went ahead and went up. And that's when they had the Battle of the Little Bighorn. As you mentioned, Hunting Horse lived to be 107 years old. And he rode horses even at age 92. Can you imagine all the stories one must have when they live to be 107 years old? Can you imagine all the stories one must have when they live to be 107 years old? The Kiowa and Comanche and Apache were taken captive by the U.S. government and held at Fort Sill, and some aided the military and, like your hunting horse, even became a scout. The skill they brought to the table was like nothing the military had seen before, and there grew a great deal of respect between captor and captive. And in your great-grandpa's case, this respect carried on even after his death. Speaking of the military, for years I've been fascinated by Native Code Talkers. For anyone who doesn't know the history of the Code Talkers and the significant part they played in the wars, let's briefly delve in. So in World War I and II, the military would send internal communications with coded messages via radio or telephone. Those coded messages were in Native American languages from tribes such as Comanche, Choctaw, Kiowa, Navajo, 33 different tribes in all. Keep in mind, the enemy would sometimes intercept those messages, so this is why a very unknown language, such as a Native American language, was so crucial. Could you imagine Germans, for instance, trying to find an interceptor, and not a single one could be found to solve the language? Sometimes there wasn't a Native word that was equivalent to the English word, too. So, for instance, the Navajo translated submarine, a word they didn't have in their vocabulary, of course, to iron fish. There are very few code talkers around today, and they deserve our highest respect because they were instrumental in aiding in the success of the United States missions. Remember Wind Talkers from 2002, y'all? Great movie. Grab some popcorn and watch it again because it's a true story about the Navajo code talkers in World War II. Now, how does this relate to you, Monroe? Because your dad was actually a Kiowa code talker. I mean, most people will never say they knew a code talker, much less their own father is one truly a hero tell us more yes uh, my dad uh, didn't talk a lot about when he was in the military but every once while he would share a story with us Uh, you know his buddies being combat and he uh, was a uh, he uh, was a part of the team of the I don't know what those howitzers the Mm -hmm. cannons Mm -hmm. uh, that he he participated in at one point I guess after the war and everything, they were told not to say anything about it, about being a cold. Oh, really? Yes. And uh, that's why a lot of them kept silent about your Mm -hmm. family members talking about their family members being in the military, but they never mentioned that until recently. After my dad passed away, we, they finally came out and, and uh, mentioned it. Everybody else knew before we did. Wow. <laughs> in 2014, they invited my brothers and two other family members, two other families, uh, to come to Washington, D.C. to be a part of that uh, reception of the gold medal to the Code Talkers. So we asked our tribe to help us, but we never did get an answer. So we, we all paid our own way to go to Washington, D.C. My brothers and uh Another family was the Paddle T family. Mm-hmm. Their co talker dad, grandpa was James Paddle T. And then the other one was Leonard Cosette Sr., the Cosette family. Mm-hmm. And so we'll all sit representatives to Washington. And we was in the big rotunda. I'm not for sure what that big area is called at the nation's capital. And uh, we were all seated. And we went in, and there was the other tribes. There was Lakotas, Poncas, Omahas, uh, all of the different tribes were gathered there. And our chairman at the time of the tribe didn't want to go up there. So our oldest member of the families 
the COSAT, Leonard Jr., he stood in for our chairman. And so after the presentations and everything, they brought the gold medals out for each tribe that was going to receive. And, and uh, Leonard Cosette Jr. went up to receive that for our tribe. You know, it was a big event, and it was it was awesome. And then when we got through there, we went to the Native American Museum, mm -hmm. uh, Museum of Native Americans. And when we were there, uh, five of us, we all had war bonnets, and we put our war bonnets on when we went there. And the, that Museum of Native Americans, they gave each family member a silver medal. Wow. And so we went up and we all received that. They let us say a few words. And yeah, that was awesome too. What a moment. It was it was a long trip, but it was well worth it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great wow. experience to go and be a part of that oh whole. Oh my gosh. You must have just felt so much honor for your father at that moment and the fact that you all got to share in that super special. I wish he could have been alive to have received that honor too, but Yeah, it was a it was awesome. I mean, it was almost unbelievable, you know, to be there and again be recognized. It was just uh, mm -hmm. coming from a small area here in Oklahoma yes, sir. and being a part right? of that. And being the, Native American, yeah. you know, you've had this history of there's hunting horse and the Kiowa Five and your code talker dad. I mean, this. So we, yeah, we we came back and we were pretty proud and happy to receive all of the accolades and everything that happened in yes, Washington D.C. So exciting. Well, and then you know there were a lot of fun times in the Satov household as well. You mentioned this story to me one time about the Tin Lizzie. Oh, I got to hear about that again. It's great. Okay, uh, we used to live with my. My grandpa, and he, there was a house right next to my grandfather's place up by Saddle Mountain, foothills of Saddle Mountain, and we lived there a while. But my dad and one of the sisters grew up with their grandmother, Pitoma. Mm -hmm. She raised them. And so my dad, and he, he's the only boy, and uh, there's, uh, what, five sisters. And in their younger day, my grandpa had a Model T and it had a surrey, a canvas or a leather top to it, you know, with the old style of automobile. Mm -hmm. And my oldest aunt wanted to take a ride to the store being out in the country. The store was probably about five miles away, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, those cars top speed was like 35, 40 miles an hour. They wanted to go. And my grandpa said, if, if you take all of them, then you can go. So they said, yes. So they all piled in the old automobile, and they began to go. And my grandpa specifically said, don't go over 15 miles an hour. <laughs> so anyway, they took off. My dad was little, but he remembers. And that gravel roads, you know, they were going. And, of course, my aunt was driving, and they were going fast. And they, there was this curve coming up. And so when they got 25 miles an hour or so, she tried to turn that curve and that gravel caught them. <laughs> and they went off the side of the road and went in the ditch and then they hit the embankment and all that dust was flying all over and everything. <laughs> and when my the dust cleared, my dad looked around. He was waving that dust away. And all he could see was my aunt, when they hit embankment, her head went through that leather <laughs> canopy that was over and her head was stuck in that that um <laughs> like she couldn't outside get the out roof. <laughs> yeah she was outside the roof but her body was inside the car and oh my and, God. <laughs> and she was hollering around get me out of here get me out of here <laughs> they weren't worried about the wreck you know i guess they told her if she, if she was all right they were worried about my grandpa what he yeah. was gonna do when <laughs> When he's seen all that, yeah. They're and, like, uh, don't mind the fact that our head's sticking out of the roof. we got to worry about Dad being mad. Yeah, I guess that was the, <laughs> the, one of the first sliding overhead openings in the, yeah. in the vehicle. But, yeah, that he said that was that was funny. And he don't remember getting back home, but he remembers them getting that wreck. And his oldest sister, her arms were going all over, and she was kicking. <laughs> she would say, help me, get me out of here. <laughs> Ken Lizzie, yes. I love it. I'll tell you another story. My grandmother 
she doesn't like the storms. I mean, any little cloud, you know, she, she's ready to go into the storm shelter. And the storm shelter, she kept it clean. It was spick and span, had a door. Of course, they had kerosene lanterns and candles and water. And I mean, you know, she was just prepared right. all the time. So this one time, this storm start coming up from the west, big dark cloud coming, and she went in and, and she said to my grandpa, she said, big storm's coming up, better get ready to go into the cellar. And uh, he said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go in there. He said, if it's my time, then it's my time. So my grandma oh my got gosh. all the rest of the family, and that storm was coming closer and closer. She was, so she said, get in. Uh, the storm shelter, so they went down and got in and got everything ready and lit the kerosene lamps and everything. And so she was praying, you know, everything. So she said, you better come in. This is your last chance. And he said, no, I'm I'm, I'm going to stay up here. So my grandma went out. She's a spiritual praying woman. Mm -hmm. So while they were in the storm shelter, my grandma went out and she faced that storm. And she raised her hand and she she began to pray hard as she could and when she prayed that storm turned to the south wow yeah and it, it was just coming all of a sudden it just turned south start going that way man and she said oh the right praise the lord thank you jesus so she said okay y'all come out of the storm shelter everything's gonna be all right that storm turned away i prayed and everything's good so she went in. She said, we're going to be all right. That storm went south, and uh, it's not going to harm us. And my grandpa looked at her and said, uh, what's wrong with you, woman? She said, what's, what do you mean, what's wrong? He said, that storm went south, and you sent that storm to my people. They live on the <laughs> south side over here. So he got mad at her for sending that storm the wrong direction. <laughs> That's great. Um, so you and I, we grew up right smack dab in the middle of the plains, and you are from the, one of the plains tribes, the Kiowa, of course. The plains are about right through the middle of the U.S., and those tribes that lived here originally were the Kiowa, Arapaho, Blackfoot, Cheyenne, Comanche, Crow, Lakota, Cree, Plains, Ojibwe, Tonkawa, and more. So what else can you tell us about your ancestry and your tribe? Well, uh, it's like I said earlier, when the military, I guess, conquered the Kiowa people and uh, probably the Comanches also, they took away our religion. And we had traditional ceremonies way back in a day, but after the military took them away from us, we never went back to them. So today we have what we call a Kiowa Gort clan or Gort dance, which is most Kiowas, if you ask them, it, it, they say it originated in Kiowa country. Of course, all of the tribes nowadays throughout the nation, they do the court dance, and then they'll have their powwows with the war dance in northern or southern. But that's one of the main traditional dances now. And we do have the Native American church, which is a tradition from way back, which we, I believe, got from the Navajo. We do what we call a southern style or way of ceremonies, but some of the tribe members they married into other tribes and so you know the northern style the fancy shawl and the other types of dances mm -hmm. come in nowadays you know they a lot of it is about competition when i was little i remember the dances that that we had we even wore dance during the day nowadays that's kind of unheard of mm. uh, unless you're in an air-conditioned place you know but, yeah, I remember dances that they had. At, at, actually, one was at Stephen Malpope's home place out there west of Interdarko. They used to have a, a dance ground out there, and we'd dance during the day. Nowadays, they mainly war dance during the nighttime. Hmm. And the gourd dance was a part of our, I'm not sure when it, back in the 40s, somewhere around there, the gourd dance became active again in our tribe. They don't talk about powwows being too much of our people, but we talked about earlier that Monroe and the Kiowa Phi, they went out and they, they war dance, and uh, Monroe sing the war dance songs, mm -hmm. you know, so I know that that was a part of our history also. And right. The old style way of dancing, uh, southern style of songs, they're lower in pitch than mm. the northern style. The northern style has a higher pitch 
in their songs that they mm-hmm. sing. Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, you can tell by the, the songs that they sing which which is which, you know, mm-hmm. pretty much so. And the Ohoma is one of the dances that came to our people. And don't quote me, but I believe that Ohoma came from the Ute tribe. Okay. And it was a gift. They brought bustles down and they gave them to the Kiowa people so that they could use in their ceremonials. Uh-huh. And the, they have special bustles that they wear uh, when they have the Ohma dance. And that's coming up in August. Okay. They're, Will they're, you be participating in that? No. Uh, my brother was a member of that, but I would go to them, but I never did mm-hmm. participate with, with them. What type of dances do you usually do? My wife and I, we used to compete in the Ivor dance, feather dance, and she mainly buckskin. Of course, she would mm-hmm. cloth dance also. And then uh, we, when our little daughter was born, she'd go with us. We Almost every other weekend, we'd go to some powwow. And, yeah. You know, we'd participate in some of the other dances. And my wife plays more than me. I, I must say she's she's recognized pretty much, you know, wherever she goes. Wow. And, Nowadays, that's about what all powwows are about is competition, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I did war dance, and then I started to straight dance. Of course, I got all my regalia for gore dancing, too. So we were a part of that, and my grandpa, he said, Grandson, anytime you go out in the arena, you pray. He said, because you don't know what's out there, good or bad. You just need to make sure that you cover yourself. So mm-hmm. I always remember that, and I yeah. prayed for Johanna and I, and our family whenever we go out there and participate. Yeah. So that's something good that I always remember. In my dad's day, he never did go to a lot of powwows because he was a preacher. And uh, I guess to him, you know, it's something that you ha- kept separate. Okay. But in the, my day, we danced and we went to church on Sunday. So it wasn't a big deal for me. But And I don't want to bring religion in or Christianity up in this, but oh, no. the Bible says life. all nations, tribes, and tongues shall gather before the throne of mercy and grace. Mm-hmm. And when I read that, I said, man, there's something to this. I can be a Christian. I can be proud of who I am as a Native American. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that bridge the gap mm-hmm. that my dad separated, but then can be a Christian and pray and read the Bible. And we also can be proud of who we are who god made us you know absolutely so that made a lot of sense to me and so we never did give up really participating slow down a little bit but we still yeah it's a spiritual thing it's a religious ceremony and all that but it also i'm not going to shy away from saying it is good exercise as well yes it is it's hard work well it i find that the kiowa are very interesting in doing some research i was reading that they used to cut their hair from the outer edge area of the eyes all the way back to the ears so that their hair wouldn't get caught in the arrow they were shooting with their bow. And when other tribes described the Kiowa, they would make a motion with two fingers from the eye to the back of the ear as sign language describing the Kiowa haircuts. And the language is known as Kiowa Tanoan, as you know better than I. And then um, there was also the plain sign language talk, as you mentioned. And most people, as I mentioned earlier, they assume that All Indians live in teepees, but many tribes did not. However, the Kiowas are one of the few tribes that did live in teepees, and they hunted buffalo as the main food source. And then eventually they were introduced to horses, and the ancestors that you know and love hunted them on foot, and they'd have to get very close to the buffalo and then shoot the arrows. But then once they were able to ride their horses, it was a game changer because, you know, before they were able to hop on the horse, they would sometimes have to wear hides of wolf or coyote to disguise themselves. And so, again, hop on the horse and use their bows and arrows or hop off the horse and pierce them with long lances while they're going along. So then they'd eat the meat, broiled or dried or roasted, prepared by the women. And then they'd use nearly every part of the buffalo, including the hide that was used for teepees. So I was also reading Monroe that the Kiowa would dress up their horses in masks that were beaded and paint their bodies as hunting horse did when he was younger and put feathers in their manes. I think that's interesting how they prepare the horses for battle as well. And then along came the removal in the 1800s, and most people know that time as the Trail of Tears that took place when the government was forcing the Indians to be removed from their territory and placed them into Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma. 
So when the government started moving the Cherokee and the Muscogee, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw into your territory, the Kiowa territory, it caused a lot of conflict. So you and I would have been warring tribes, Monroe. Could have been having skirmishes. I want to uh, go back just a little bit. They did have to, before the horse, and by the way, they called the, the horse the big dog because they did have dogs. <laughs> and they, really? They, the dogs carried all of most of their weight, teepee poles and, and all that. But they did have to sneak up on their prey. But a lot of times what they would do is herd the buffalo to where there was a cliff and they mm. would run them off the cliff and then that's how they got wow, some of their really? uh, food. And instead of chasing them or trying to get to them, they, they did that, run them off the cliff, and then they went down, of course, took care of the, the meat and the hides and whatever else. Hmm. So I, I just want to uh, right here share a story with you. When they were giving the land, uh, 160 acres to the tribes, they were also asking all of the members to go in and register. Mm -hmm. And the, the place that before Fort Sill was at Anadarko, that was the agency. So when my grandfather went in, they asked him, what's your name? And he said, Saint Oki. That's how you say it in Kiowa. Ah. Saint Oki. So when they said, what? Saint Oki, that's my name. And so I guess they just start writing it down the way that they pronounced it. And that's the way they came up with T-S-A-T-O-K-E. Wow. A hunting horse. That's how we got our last name. Interesting. I hear that there are about 12,000 Kiowa left today and very few speakers of the Kiowa language remaining. In comparison, my tribe, the Choctaw, have 200,000 members right now, so definitely a big discrepancy there. I know you're trying to keep your culture and traditions and art alive with your kids and grandkids. The other day, uh, you were showing me a pair of buckskin leggings that you were making for your grandson. What other things do you do now in your retirement? I've always made stuff for my family and my daughters. I make them stuff. Their aunts make my, I have two daughters, so they make their dresses. And my mom had a buckskin dress made for my youngest daughter. And so we, we just took care of ourselves and learn by ourselves. You know, you can go and pay for a pair of moccasins or a buckskin dress and it's going to cost you an arm or leg. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not having the money. I just figured out, might as well just make it myself. So my oldest grandson is 21, and so I probably made for him, maybe since he was a baby, probably 10 pairs of moccasins. And people ask me to make, make them some or their family members, and most of the time I'll refuse mm -hmm. because I, I, I'm not doing it for money expenses mm -hmm. I'm doing it because I know that they're going to remember that when I'm not here they'll say my grandpa made this for me just yeah, just for remembering sure. that you know that they'll take care of it and remember that I cared enough to make them something so I try to whatever it is I, I, I ask questions call different ones and ask them how do you do this how do you do that and mm -hmm. you know just learn myself like the leggings you you just mentioned i was gonna have them made but it's like twenty five hundred dollars just to have the leggings made wow so uh when we went to devil's tower a few years ago uh we stopped in this town called custer city <laughs> yeah oh boy yeah i know uh it was a, <laughs> it was just a vacation site so i we went to this little store and uh i collect coins and they had a bunch of these Indian hit pennies. Mm -hmm. And I bought almost everything they had of their those pennies. Then I was looking around and I seen these buckskin hides. They were pretty big. I don't know. They might have been elk hides. Mm -hmm. But they were pretty big. And I, I was just trying to think ahead. And I said, I could probably use these. And I asked them. They didn't want maybe $80, which is you know not that mm -hmm. much for a hide. So I said, well, let me have four of them. And I bought four hides, thinking that later on I could use them. So I went ahead and bought them, and I had them in my storage just waiting for that day to use them. So when it came time, uh, we were getting ready for this 4th of July, and I wanted my grandson, he's interested. While he's interested, uh, I wanted to get him in there because mm -hmm. he might lose his interest. So my mom made mine. And I just cherish those leggings. Oh, of course. So I said, well, I, I just go by her pattern. 
and I tried to base those leggings on her pattern, and they turned out pretty good. Nice. You know, they, I'm not ashamed to say that I made them. Yeah, but absolutely. Not, they, they they weren't ready by this four, so and I just got to do a little bit more on them, and then I'm making hit, my grandson likes blue, mm-hmm. so we got blue beadwork, and and I'm making him some new blue moccasins, Kiowa style. So yeah, and then uh, we'll be ready for the next one. So I made myself. You know, several pair. I made Johanna some. I made my daughter a, a spear, beaded it myself, and put it together. Breastplates, just whatever. I can make belts, concho belts, and just try to do it the best I can. Yeah. You know, not just to save money because of the value later on, you know, that they can use it and they'll have their own. And like you said, for them to have those forever and be able to <clears> think <throat> of you when they're Wearing them, looking at them, using them in powwows, special. Yeah, and then, you know, they're they're on my to-do list. I've got a ways to go, but I'm checking as I make, you know, go down the line. And, of course, painting, too. i got some ideas for artwork. When you retire, they say every day is like a Saturday. And so I, I'm teaching myself to make myself get up and do something. Yeah. But once I get started, you know, it's a, a passion it's something mm-hmm. that I want to do. It's not that I have to do it. Yeah, you but want to. I want to. So that uh, incentive to what they say, get her done. Get so, her done. Well, as an yeah. artist too, it must be so nice to now have this <laughs> time to do stuff you want to do, and the art that comes to your head when you're laying there at night, you can just get up the next day and do it. You don't yeah. have to go to work. I'm yeah. so jealous. And and you said that your favorite saying is, "Knowledge is some, master of none." which I think I'm adopting now. As an art teacher going to college and learning all of the jewelry, pottery, ceramics, arts and crafts, Mm -hmm. painting, watercolor, acrylics, oils, pastels, all of that stuff I'm pretty good at. So I try to teach. When I teach, I try to give what what I call a rounded art education, Mm -hmm. 7th and 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, and they get all of those And by the time that they're juniors and seniors, they kind of have an idea of what they like. And so when they become those, then I can, we can concentrate on a certain area, you know, and uh, spend more time with that. So. Absolutely. And that knowledge of some master of none. And hopefully (laughs) with podcasts like these, hopefully we're helping others, including myself to learn more and perhaps we'll master a thing or two here and there. And as we're learning, let us all consider helping others. There's a society that means a lot to you that you'd like to share about. So please do. In 1974, that my in-laws, they started an organization called a Taipei Society of Oklahoma, and it started out as a part of the gourd dance. That was the main feature. My father-in-law loved the gourd dance, and so that was the main feature in his day. Since then, being a part of the family and participating and camping and Mm -hmm. enjoying all that good stuff outdoors, it just became a part of our lives. So we look forward to it every year. My daughters and grandkids, they they all are are excited. This year, we uh, decided to have a a two-day powwow, and that big rain that came, it flooded us out. And what happened was that the lake, there's a lake north of us, Mm -hmm. and they opened the floodgates. And so it just came, and it just drowned our powwow grounds out. So we had to cancel. So disappointing. Yeah, we prepared for a year and a half. Hopefully you can copy and paste for next year. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, we, we started that Saturday afternoon, but by 4 o'clock we had to just stop everything because yeah. it started to build up. And so everybody got out of there safe. There's no accidents or anything. And then uh, the next day we went back, and it was five inches of water all through the whole no. campground. So, but we are planning to have a dance Last week in August, last weekend, just the one day. Yeah. And have all of the same head staff. And, of course, they have contests in all categories. So it's kind of, a, I guess, a makeup. We do gourd dance, and we have one of our Kawa men to lead the singing. Just a, a time for people to get together and, and have a good time. We have different contests, like Lulu contests. You know what Lulu is? Mm-mm. 
Well, it's mainly just the women. They uh, make a noise with their mouth. When you get all excited and you, you know, you have what they call a special that, you know, you, know, you want to honor somebody, then the women, they lulu. Mm -hmm. Then we have a men's warrior cry. Mm -hmm. And then we have prettiest shawl, prettiest vest. And uh, it's just mainly, it's, it's a good feeling there. It's intertribal. That means that there's everybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, certain tribe that's doing it. We just... We just wanted to everybody to come and have a good time, enjoy friendship, make new friends, old friends. We have friends that come from Utah, wow, out in Arizona, New Mexico. So yeah, it sounds like any tribe can come. It's the end of August. Is there a website where folks can find more information? We do post on Facebook. If you go to Time Face Society, T I A dash P I A H. Taipei Society of Oklahoma, just everybody's welcome to come and participate or just look on. They have vendors down there. They have food vendors. They have arts and crafts and raffles. So it's good. I've been a part of that since I've been in this family, and, and it's been something that I look forward to every year. Absolutely. So you, our listeners, are invited. And again, last week of August, Right now, it's July of 2021. It usually is from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but because of the pandemic, we mm -hmm. just made it two days. And then in August, we're just having it on that Saturday. Okay. Just one day. Just one day. Yeah, okay. just, I guess, uh, you know, because so many people had called and they said, we, we're sorry, got rained uh, out. And right. Are you going to have another one? So we said, we'll decide. We'll go ahead and have something you know, for everybody. Hopefully I can make it down too. I know I'm probably coming back in September, so maybe I can make it end of August, early September or something. Yeah, so. yeah everybody's welcome. That's great. Well, Yako Ki, Monroe, thank you for sharing such valuable insights into your fascinating family and history, the Code Talker, the Kiowa Five, your talent as an artist yourself, and so much more. This Choctaw is highly impressed. Well, you're welcome, and, and uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, in everything that we do, we try to end with a prayer, yeah. and if I can, uh, I know uh, your dad, and we made just a great friendship, and uh, haven't seen him in a while, but, you know, just pray everything goes good for you and your family, and, I and would this love that. adventure that you're doing, uh, it seems like you got everything in order, and I, I know it'll be a success, Thank whatever, you, whatever you try. And try to pray in my Kiowa language. Bay thaw hollow. Dalki pan my thaw my thaw day. Dalki thay honda yanom. Dalki ae thay honda yanom yan hag ya daw. Ongo al koyon bay do him. Bay ya dalki, I mean, they ki ya o boy daw. Hego be tai do. Hego be ta do. Ae kon bay do. A heavenly father. Above the clouds, we thank you for making life. Jesus Christ, we thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us. Continue to be with us. Watch over us. Forgive us in it for our shortcomings. All these things I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I hope. Yakuki. Are you looking for a new adventure? Learn to fly at Chickasha Wings. Right here at Chickasha Wings, we teach people to fly. We've got 11 airplanes, 9 flight instructors, and about 5 mechanics. We turn out about 80 new certificates or ratings each year. And we train pilots who now fly at the major airlines. We have, they fly for the Air Force, the FAA, for private jets. They even have a few missionary pilots. Our customers come from all over the United States. Here at Chickasha, we're able to provide lower costs, a more focused training program, and we're able to provide a higher level of customer service. My favorite thing about this business is helping people, because I see people go from not knowing anything about it to being an airline pilot. Come out here and learn to fly. Your adventure awaits at Chickasha Wings. For more information, check out ChickashaWings.com. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. 
Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>